The second point here, people who move here start to gain weight and, uh, and their level of diabetes goes up. Now, I don't want to just pick on Dubai because this is happening in cities around the world. So we all need to be very careful and we need to build places that make health and happiness a part of our daily lives. This is now happening with the Vision Zero movement. The Vision Zero movement began in France, in European cities, it's now being exported around the world. It says nobody, it's not okay for any pedestrian ever to die in traffic. Now I'm not here to talk to you about traffic safety. What I find remarkable about Vision Zero is, when you begin to squeeze your streets to make them safer, you also make them more social. People are crossing them, they're creating friendships on both sides of the streets, and it's creating a more dynamic economy. So it's happening everywhere, from wide to narrow. It's happening in Mexico City, where they have much lower budgets than many of your cities. And I'm just thrilled to see it's happening now in Dubai. Um, this is just off Sheikh Zayed Road. It's wonderful to see this small space, which was once a vehicle space, turned into a place of play, of joy for children. So when you're thinking about Happy City, yes, think about your water slide and your roller coaster, but also think about small things. Okay, this last theme I want to talk to you about on the well-being side is about inclusion. I want to introduce you to this woman. Her name is Eva Kale. She's from Vienna. She invented a, a term called gender mainstreaming. And I know it's a, it's a big phrase, and I was intimidated by it when I first heard it. And then the, I realized the concept is quite wonderful. What Eva Kale realized as she walked around Vienna was that her city had been planned by men for men. And that meant it was sometimes difficult for women to move through the city. So what you're looking at here is her pointing to a significant piece of broken and now repaired urban infrastructure. You probably can't see it. I couldn't see it. Eva Kale took groups of elderly women on tours of the city and when they walked up here, they were carrying purses, and their purses would get caught on the edge of the railing because it was not rounded. And then they would trip and fall. So what these elderly women said was, Eva, put a round corner on it so my purse doesn't catch and so I don't fall down. Just a little detail. But these details get expressed now all over Vienna. They are building a city that works for women, so it works for everybody. So here you see um, uh, infrastructure for people with seeing difficulties. You see a staircase going down. The elderly woman can't make it. They built an elevator for her. City for everybody. What I find is remarkable is they looked at public parks in Vienna, and they realized mostly boys were playing in those parks. And for many decades, the men said, well, you know, girls just don't go to the parks. They just don't want to play in parks. But it wasn't the case. Girls were not playing in the parks because they were scared to go there or they didn't have the infrastructure to be in those parks. So they studied where girls were in parks and where they weren't. They asked girls what they needed. Well, it turns out what girls often like is they like a high place to look down on the park before they go there. They want to make sure there are many exits in case they're, they're scared, in case there are some uh, scary teenage boys there making noise. So they started to rebuild their parks to welcome girls, and all of a sudden you see these, this red coloring. This is where they actually saw girls coming back to their parks. So suddenly the infrastructure became infrastructure for everyone. Okay, to finish off, I sometimes find, particularly when we're talking with civic leaders and people in real estate, who have a special responsibility to ensure that your city budget is taken care of, and in real estate to ensure that your clients make a profit. I understand this. And that's why I want to assure you that everything you do to build a happier city is also going to help you meet the bottom line. For example, the Knight Foundation, and this is way back in 20, uh, 2010, it's not new information, but they study people's sense of place attachment in American cities. Place attachment is how connected do you feel to your city? Do you feel like you belong? And what they found was remarkable. The more people feel like they belong, the more attached they feel to the city, the more the economy grew. So what are the three top factors contributing to place attachment? Aesthetics, so people like beauty. But that's not the top one. Social opportunities. Number two, is there stuff to do? Are there places to go? 
The number one factor was inclusion, the welcome. Does this city <clears throat> feel welcoming to me and to people of all different colors, genders, sexual sexualities, um, races, um, nationalities, ages? Does the city feel welcome to everyone? And the cities that succeed on that ended up doing better. Their economies grew. Okay, what, what happens when we, companies are relocating these days to try to attract millennials, the emerging job force? Well, at least in the United States, they're moving to places that are more walkable, that have better access to transit, and that have much better access to, to bike infrastructure. So if you want to attract the young workers, that's where they want to move. They don't want to work out on the edge anymore. My friend Joe Minikazi, look him up, he's at urban3.com. He's brought um, what he calls a farmer's perspective to looking at cities. Joe says, don't invest on the rocky ground, invest in the fertile ground. What does he mean by that? Joe looks at tax productivity per acre. And I know not all of you collect property or sales tax, but you might want to think about job productivity per acre. And what Joe has found, and yes, uh, they use acre in the United States, so think of it for hectare if you like. So what they found is that um, in the centers, in the walkable centers of places, the connected places, the denser places, investments in new infrastructure, in buildings, they produce 20 times the tax revenue in sales tax and in property tax, but they also produce something like 10 times the number of jobs. So think about that. When you're building infrastructure out to the edge, say for example here, out into the desert, Remember, you're going to have to maintain that infrastructure for another 100, 200, 500 years. It's very expensive when you get a much better return in the center. Finally, we found in working with developers more recently that they are increasingly getting switched on to this notion of building happier places. We think the global leader is British land. Uh, they approached us, they wanted to be leaders in well-being. The British, they're very sober, they don't, they're not ready for the word happiness yet, so you're ahead of them in, in the Emirates. So they said, let's just call it well-being, that's much more serious. They wanted to be world leaders in well-being. So they said, first of all, let's apply um, uh, the evidence to our built places, mixed-use places and cities. Then let's audit those places. So we worked with them to audit Paddington Central in London, just north of Paddington Station. You should take a look at it. And then we used that, they used the audit to totally remake the place. So see if you notice any happiness interventions. This is Paddington Central four years ago. It's just a basic business area. There's some, there's some mixed use, there's some housing nearby. It's pretty British, right? Pretty sober, pretty calm, pretty serious. What happens when it gets a happiness renovation? Boom. It's amazing, Kingdom Street, it now feels like you're walking through a beautiful garden. There's a herb garden, you can smell the herbs, there are places to play, there are places to hang out with other people. And, you know, we were feeling pretty good about this, and we said, you know, isn't it great that you want to build a happier city? And British Land said to us, no, talk to our lease managers. They're the ones who drove this process, they're the ones who realized we're competing with other mixed use places in the city, and if we don't build happier, we're not going to be attracting tenants. But that night, when we took them out for a beer, they admitted, and I'm talking about the CEO level of decision makers, they admitted, once they calmed down a little bit, that they're doing this to serve society, and they're doing it to serve their own hearts, because they know they're building for people, and they need to feel good about the places they're building. So, I usually leave you right there, and finish with this notion that happy places are gonna make you money. But I'm not content with just that. Can I give you one more picture and one last story? And I want you to hold the story of this little boy in your head throughout the next couple of days. This kid's name is Matthias. He's five years old. If you look at this picture and feel scared, please raise your hands right now. Okay. So some of you are parents. Interesting. I felt scared too when I met Matthias. It was his first day of school. This is in a community called Vauban in Germany outside of Freiburg. Now I want to assure you, you don't need to be scared for this kid. He's five years old, biking to school on his first day of school with his mother. 
And when we got to school, he looked up at me and he said, tomorrow, I'm going to bike to school all by myself. And I laughed. I thought it was the funniest thing. And his mother said, yes, no, he's going to. Do any of you remember a time, maybe in your own lives, when you had that freedom as a child to move through your city without fear, without danger from cars? In Vaubon, they're living that right now because they've built a community that works first of all for children. The speed limit is five kilometers an hour. The streets are narrow. It's connected to the city. It is not gated, but it's a place for everyone. Everyone begins their day with a short walk. So think about how you can build infrastructure, mostly for children, and then you'll get it right for everyone else. And I want to assure you, if you plan for happiness, if you design for happiness, if you build for happiness, you will create cities that are wealthier, that are healthier, that are more connected, that are more full of joy, that are better for everyone. I so look forward to hearing your stories about that journey. And I thank you, your excellencies, for hearing me today.